education plan. And as we transition, I know Mrs. Andrews asked for a moment of personal privilege on this. Thank you. And uh, once the team comes up for the presentation, I'd like to uh, have a point of personal privilege to ask the superintendent and the board to come down uh, for some congratulations based on a wonderful, wonderful person who is from our district, Dr. Garcia, who has been really knighted by Spain. If, if I may, uh, uh, Mr. Shaw, so yeah, so last Friday, uh, there was a special event that occurred down in Coral Gable, Gables, and uh, Dr. Pinkos, myself, you, Ms. Andrews, had that opportunity to attend a very special event, um, and you want to tell them exactly what occurred, Ms. Andrews? Absolutely. It's just such an exciting time for our school district. On last Friday, June 1st, the Council General of Spain, the Honorable Don Cardito Christ, held a formal ceremony at his home in Coral Gables to recognize the contributions of Dr. Joaquim Garcia to the community of Palm Beach County. The King of Spain, Felipe VI, decreed that Dr. Joaquim Garcia be inducted into Spain's royal order, the Order of Civil Merit. The Order of Civil Merit established by King Alfonso XIII of Spain in 1926 recognizes the civic virtue of officers in the service of the nation as well as extraordinary service by Spanish and foreign citizens for the benefit of Spain. King Felipe VI of Spain, Minister of Foreign Affairs, ordered and bestowing of the order to Dr. Garcia in recognition of his long standing advocacy for civil rights, exemplary service to the community, <coughs> and dedication to educational equity and access for all students. The Council General Crace highlighted in his remarks Dr. Garcia's international efforts aimed at stopping the global spread of HIV virus, his volunteer community work to assist the homeless, his dedication to the proclamation of the Spanish language, and his leadership in partnering with the school district of Palm Beach County to ensure educational equity for all students. Men awarded this order of civil merit are referred to as dawn and are considered to be the equivalent of knights. I say to you, Don Joaquin Garcia, we recognize you from the school district of Palm Beach County, our superintendent <coughs> and all of our school employees. Let's come down and greet him.
First, I would like to, can, I, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Thanks, I would like to thank you all for uh, this recognition. Um, I'm humble. Uh, it, it's been a week of a emotional roller coaster. Um, but it's a great thing. When you do things that come from the heart, it comes easy. It, it, it's an easy work. Uh, and in our way of doing it, we hope that people see us as an encouragement, as a, someone who they can emulate to, to continue our work. And that's, that's the hope for advocacy, that people that come, prepare people that come behind us to continue the work. So I want to thank you all for the work that you have done for the kids of Palm Beach County School District. I had the opportunity to see where the dual language is going through Keith, and I am very, very happy to see uh, the advancements that we're doing. Not enough, not enough, but we are in, in our way to it. So I encourage you to continue. Uh, Dr. Fenoy, Dr. Robinson, Marsha, Andrews, Karen Brill, Erica, Barbara, and Julian, you have been great as well. So, um, and I must say that one of the people that have inspired me more uh, in, in, in this quest for excellency in dual language it has been Margarita Pincos. Margarita Pincos has been an incredible advocate for, for dual language, for bilingualism, and for giving us, all, all the children, the necessary tools to succeed and to thrive in the global economy. Thank you so very much for this. And thank you, thank you, that's all I can say. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Dr. Don Joaquin Garcia. <laughs> and we're gonna officially dedicate this workshop to you because I know you have been I'm never gonna ask you. that one, right? No, you, will, you are not. So, if we're gonna go ahead and get started, this is uh, the Global Language Plan update. It will incorporate the dual language. I know the board has been asking for this for some time, so we're very excited about providing this to you. Dr. Pincos and Mr. Oaxaca have been working very closely and. Dr. Pinkos, in particular with her new role, about some really exciting news. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to them um, and talk about uh, some of the next steps when it comes to global education here in Palm Beach County. Okay, well thank you for all of you who have been asking for this, uh, for this update and now we're really excited. Not only that we are in front of you, but we are giving you really exciting news that, um, that I think you're going to enjoy. So first, I just wanted to tell you uh, how we uh, have structured the presentation. We're going to um, first talk about why. Uh, why is the reason that is guiding us uh, to do this work? Uh, we're clarifying the terminology because sometimes these programs are very fluid and it sometimes it's hard to differentiate which is which. Uh, we wanna talk a little bit about our current state, our desired state, and then we're gonna talk about how are we expanding. So the rationale. Uh, we have two quotes there. One uh, that I particularly like uh, is from Greg Roberts and it talks about that monolingualism is the illiteracy of the 21st century. So the, the, the basis of what an, a good education is, uh, is that includes an additional number of languages. Uh, but our board has already recognized that and, uh, and already in our vision and our mission, uh, these statements that are highlighted in red, you have chosen those statements to prepare students for the world that they're going to grow into. And this work that we're doing right now is, is operationalizing that vision statement and, and, and our mission statement. So just really quick, um, I'm going to highlight a few of the benefits of bilingualism. Um, it, uh, we know that it obviously increases communication among people, increases the 
the, the range of people that they can communicate with. But there's other gains, for example, cognitive skills. There's a lot of a body of work on how students deal with conflict better when they speak more than one language, um, how they score higher in SAT and, 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 and additional testing. And there's even a great body of research um, proving that bilingual people can um, uh, forestall dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So even even in that in that field. Uh, so I so let's just talk about a little bit of the terminology because sometimes in our district we either have uh, world languages or dual language and we just have a hard time uh, finding out which one is which. And and the rest of the of the presentation we're going to constantly refer to these issues. Uh, global citizen are those skills that students need in order to be citizens of the world. How is it that they, um, that what are this, the cross-cultural skills that they have to acquire to look at every impact or every content that they study, what is the impact on a bigger world? Um, and obviously global competence is the capacity for the students to be able to function and be able to understand the political and the social components of, of global uh, citizenship. Um, World Languages is an instructional program that has been around in the past with foreign language, but now it um, it's, uh, has been coined as World Languages, and it talks about uh, not only how to speak the languages, but also all of the pieces of communication and, uh, and collaboration that are part of languages. And finally, dual language is, um, we have, uh, there is a couple, two-way immersion or one-way immersion, and it's a, a program in which students uh, learn from each other and students are uh, spend their, their half of the day or a full day, depending on how it's implemented, in, in learning in the language of instruction for the purpose of not only acquiring that language, but also functioning in that language. Uh, and this is what I was referring, language instruction in the 21st century is not just speaking a language, it's also being able to communicate, to be able to, to cross cultures and to be able to understand uh, and, and to make connections with others. So in our district, um, we, we want to be able to offer schools a wide range of choices. So, so even from the point of it's just a very basic sister school in which a, a, a school may have a collaboration with another a school in another country, the teachers are planning uh, instructional materials, they're creating, there is, there is a program at the national level that we would like to be part of in which they have teams competing in project-based learning but those teams are comprised by students that are in different countries and they plan together. And that's one of the areas in which we want to be guided to, to increase our sister school projects to, to that level. Uh, World Languages Program, we want to uh, explore a, a bigger scope, uh, quantity of languages and, uh, and, and, and of offerings. Uh, we have done a lot of work this year on international collaboration so that the, the students, it's not that we're telling them that how to work in a, in, and collaborate internationally, but that we are doing that to be able to, to meet this, the, the needs of the students. Um, we have partnered with the Asia Society. Asia Society is not just about Asia. It's, uh, it's the, 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 the um, organization that deals the most in the United States, the United, in, just in the world, but particularly in the, in the United States has the biggest name on global education. So we have, we're working with them on being able to help us develop the, the, the how to do this work. And finally, the one piece that, um, that has been highlighted by Asia Society and other organizations is that language cannot be used in isolation. It has to be part of a career. So children don't grow up saying, I wanna be a Spanish speaker when I grow up, I wanna be an Italian speaker. They grow up saying, I wanna be an engineer, I wanna be a businessman, I wanna be a, a medical doctor. And in order to do that in a global um, context, they have to be able to function using those skills within language. And that's where we are heading to integrate this concept of global education, but also within careers and language. Um, so the Center for Global Education, you're going to hear more about that, is um, Asia Society. And uh, an Asia Society, basically it's, um, you see that wheel there has a lot of components, but basically they focus on appreciating diverse cultures and analyzing international issues and understanding world languages. Now, where are we and where do we wanna be? Our district is highly known by their culture of academics. So we want to move that culture of academics to make it 
to have equity in all offerings. So it's not just a, a, a culture of, of high academics for just some kids, but it's for every kid. Um, it's, we, have, we have a high achieving district. We want to move into students being prepared for 21st century readiness in a global competitive, competitive world. And finally, our choice programs, we, want our well, we were well known for our choice programs. We want to uh, enhance them by connecting them with language and, and global competence. Are you ready? No, not yet. You tell me when. So our successes. We have had a lot of successes this year. Okihili uh, International Spanish Academy was nominated, was, was, was won the, the middle school um, School of the Year, um, and they received their, their award in, in Washington, D.C. New Horizons was the third place. We have, a, we have developed a very strong partnership with the Norton um, uh, Museum, uh, where our students are actually participating as, as mentors in their, in their exhibits, uh, speaking the language that they have chosen. And we have multiple sister school projects. Uh, we have partnerships with foreign consulates, and out of those partnerships, we have um, students from China. Um, Mrs. McQueen was there, and uh, they have visited the two schools where we will be teaching Chinese this year. Uh, our First Lady of Japan and Mr. Barbieri was there, uh, came to visit the school that where Japanese is going to be taught. And uh, through a, a partnership with the Consul of Italy, they will be paying for a teaching position this year to teach Italian in Palm Beach County. Um, finally, we have a partnership with the Ministry of, of Education of Haiti, in which we are going to do a, a, in the summer. Uh, that will, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in, a, in another slide, but we're going to do professional development for any teacher that, has, uh, that is working with Haitian students, and we're going to be visited by the Minister of Education from Haiti and uh, four of the mayors that are part of the sister cities. Uh, the Consul General, and uh, there is talk that maybe the First Lady will come, but we don't have that confirmed. Um, so now Harvey is going to tell you a little bit more about our current offerings. So currently in our schools, in terms of our high schools, we, we do offer world language in all of our high schools. About 70% of our middle schools offer a world language, and what we really look at in terms of the languages that are offered, French and Spanish and American Sign Language are offered pretty much across the board. We do have some one or two schools who have one or two sections or courses of maybe Chinese or Haitian Creole or Latin. So um, that, that's currently happening, but there's an opportunity there as well. We do have five international Spanish academies and 22 dual language schools. And in our current state, here are some of the challenges that we see that we are working to overcome. So as you are aware, there's a feeder pattern and continuity of languages between the different levels, elementary, middle, to high school. Um, some of our areas, just in terms of the building capacity, the physical plant, are in some of our places are not um, large enough if we expand, so we need to think about what does that look like. Um, as we begin to expand or think about um, Student, uh, teachers who are bilingual, really, what does that look like? How do we, uh, because again, teaching Spanish at a world language is, is a different skill set than teaching uh, chemistry in Spanish, right? So there's two different skill sets, and so that, that looking at that and recruiting those teachers, making sure that we have uh, quality resources in target language. If we look at other languages, making sure that they're not just materials, but they are really quality materials that can support a larger program. Um, there is some financial, um, cost to, to moving forward with world languages, especially at an elementary level. We want to make sure uh, we need to add different uh, resources or different teachers, and so there is something there as well. When we talk about the time and instructional day, uh, we only have so many hours, and so thinking about how do we look at our schedule uh, more creatively, how can we infuse, as uh, Dr. Pingos talked about, maybe infusing language with academies helps us because there's only so many hours and there's lots of statutes that we need to also comply with. Um, and then equitable access. What does that mean? What does that really look like? So we, so just in general, um, in secondary schools right now, so secondary would be sixth grade through 12th grade. Um, in this last semester, um, looking at the number of students in our programs, just in general, uh, we have a, around 30% of our students were in a world language course. So in terms of all of our students, you know, we have an opportunity to provide that for more students, because one third of our students, we believe, is not enough in order for us to become really globally uh, competent and globally uh, competitive. 
But when we look at different student subgroups, again, whether we're looking at the, the white, black, or Hispanic subgroups, um, they're all around 30%. Um, with the Hispanic being just a little higher at 35% of students who are in secondary who are actually in those courses. One of the areas that are, you know, a little bit more, again, areas for growth and opportunity are around our ELLs. Those are students who are already coming with multiple languages, um, but they're only about 30% of those students who are actually in a world language in the middle or high school. And so there's some, some real opportunity there for that. So what does that mean for us largely? These are our goals. So as a, as a team um, with Global Ed, Multicultural, and the World Languages Office, these are our larger goals. We want to make sure that uh, each career academy has a uh, relevant language option. We want to make sure that in every region uh, we have a world language that course that goes from K-12. If there's a, a succinct um, offering, we also in every region want to make sure there's a dual language pathway for all of our dual language students. Um, and then also in every region, make sure we have the age the age of society that Dr. Pinkos talked about in terms of building global competency within all of our areas. And then lastly, making sure that we do reward our students who have gone through this process, um, whether it's through the seal of biliteracy or the global competency seal, which is tied to the age of society that Dr. Pinkos talked about as well. So how do we do this work? Right? That's the question we're all really asking. And so this is a quick visual. There's multiple pathways to get to this work. And so if, you, if you're seeing the, the visual right there, there are three different columns. They're elementary, middle, and high. DL means dual language school, and WL means world language. So we're all really, really familiar with the first row. A dual language school feeds to a dual language middle school, then to a dual language high school. That makes sense. Um, at, the, at, the very, you know, at the very bottom, the, the fourth option, you might, in an elementary, have a world language option that continues to feed to the middle school and the high school, but really making sure that those world languages connect. So we don't have a, a world language, for example, in Chinese in elementary, in the middle school we go to French and there's not a con continuity. So this is kind of our visual to, to look at that. So as we think about, what our goal is to make sure that students have a natural progression. And the third option, we're gonna kind of just delve into an example because there's lots of different ways that we can do this. Um, the, so if you know in the top left, so we have a, let's just say we have an elementary that's a dual language. Currently all of our dual language schools are Spanish speaking. Um, and then we'd have a world language in middle school and world language in high school. World language at this, for this particular group, if you notice the elementary on the left is a dual, a dual language Spanish. Those students would go to a middle school that would offer uh, Spanish for Spanish speakers course. So it's any, any student who is coming out of a dual language school would be a Spanish speaker. And so regardless of what their native um, home would be, whether it's uh, English speaking or Spanish speaking native homes, at, by the time they get to sixth grade, they would be a Spanish speaker. So it would be a more appropriate uh, course. And so then they would continue that path. And by the time they get to high school, they would have an option for uh, more advanced Spanish courses. Maybe it's AP or ACE, other things of that nature. In this same example, you could also have a world language, let's say in the middle school there, that, let's say in the middle it says world language Chinese. So that then could also connect to the high school, which would be world language Chinese. And as we talked about uh, with the global competency, is really tying that to the career path. So in terms of global economy, thinking about e-commerce and cybersecurity, let's say that that was their uh, career academy, then we would connect it to Chinese and make that as an option for students so that when they graduate, they have many skills that they can take into the workforce or into the college or beyond that. So that's just an example of what could happen, and these are the paths that we are working on as a team for all of our schools. So specifically, what this would do for us would expand our language instruction, the continuum of language. And this is a circle because we believe that all of these different options uh, are all really on the same playing field. It's just around their different plans for different students on the continuum and what the outcomes of each of the programs and how you get into the different programs could be different, but really exposes students to all different forms of language as we move through the continuum. And so, Specifically, we're going to talk about dual language world, and ESOL and the heritage language. So for next year, uh, as, we, as Dr. Pingo said earlier, we currently have 22 dual language schools. Our plan is to, next year, expand our dual language programs. LC Swain will start a sixth grade 
uh, cohorts, and then they will go to seventh and eighth years following. North grade is currently a dual language school, and they will expand to sixth grade. Forest Hill High School will become an official dual language school in the fall. Then next year, we will also begin planning with three other elementary schools, Meadow Park, Palm Springs Elementary, and Westgate, begin that planning year so they can begin expanding that program in years after. We currently, like we said, have some some middle school programs that we really want to, to focus on and expand what's happening at that, um, those schools. So Palm Springs, Palm Springs Middle School will be expanding. Gove Elementary School is a dual language school, but we're working to expand the offerings in third and fourth grade. They really worked on K-1 and 2 this year, moving that forward. And then as Dr. Pingles talked about this um, Jupiter Middle School, Spanish for Spanish speakers. Jupiter Elementary is a dual language school, and they don't currently have a a pathway. So we're really working on that middle school, offering the Spanish for Spanish speakers course at the middle school for those students. And then beginning um, our native language support at Barton Elementary School in the fall, really beginning to plan how we might help support them in the Haitian Creole native language support. So those are a lot of the different programs that we will be working to implement next year. And then that leads us to what does that mean in terms of world language and global ed? So when it comes to world language, we're expanding uh, to a multitude of languages, and um, uh, the ones that we are adding this year in the area of French, uh, the, the coding on this slide, uh, when you look at the purple, is uh, we have formed a partnership with the Ministry of Education of France, and it's similar to the ISA. They give an accreditation for a certain rigor of French education that is called the label France Education, uh, hopefully Becky uh, supports my pronunciation here. And, um, and we have selected um, Barton to be one of the schools in which the students would graduate, uh, would finish that school with that certificate from the Ministry of Education of France. And, uh, and Woodlands has also uh, looked at that, uh, is, is going to implement that program, but also the students can choose if they want to go to that rigor, they could go to, um, to Woodlands. If they want to continue with French, they will go to Lake Worth Middle School where uh, the principal is uh, preparing and is planning this year to, um, to implement that uh, French at the middle school level. And at the high school, there would be uh, Lake Worth and San Luis and Park Vista currently have French programs. We're adding Atlantic with a certification from the Ministry of Education of France. Um, Italian, we are uh, offering in Sunrise Park, is going to offer it at the elementary level. And um, um, she's planning to do it in a, a particularly with more uh, rigor in fourth and fifth grade so that the students are able to move into Loggers Run, who has implemented house already five uh, sections already filled with students that are interested in, uh, in Italian, and that is the school where we're placing the teacher that is the Consulate of Italy is, is providing. And um, finally, the, uh, for the planning, this is the planning year. West Boca will be the school that once those students can finish in Logger's Run would go to West Boca. Japanese is the first time. I mean, we have offered in the past without any uh, it, it structure, and, um, and this time where we, we have to select at some point an elementary school, but we have selected Logger's Run, who is kind of positioning themselves to be like the language school of the district, and uh, Logger's Run has uh, four sections of Japanese that the students have already chosen, and they're going to share a teacher with West Boca that uh, just this first year, um, are, they're having just one period of, uh, of, of Japanese. And finally, Chinese, um, the elementary schools, we would like to add it uh, um, based on funding and for, for the following year. But right now, Jupiter Middle School and Jupiter High School will be offering um, five sections of, of Chinese. And that's where we want to uh, be able to combine with the Career Academy of e-commerce and, um, and um, cybersecurity, particularly because the Department of State um, funds uh, teachers in Chinese. And, um, and we, obviously, for the reason of cybersecurity. And, uh, and we would like to be able to apply next year so we're able to get the funding from the Department of State. 
Um, so when it comes to global education, Harvey talked, uh, talked about a little bit of that global competence. There are states, for example, that uh, North Carolina, that has clearly established what is the criteria for a student to graduate with a global competence seal. And we would like to explore to get to that level, but obviously we, are, we have to be able to create global competence edu competent educators and global competent um, materials so that the students are able to get that knowledge. So we have, um, um, partner with Asia Society to have two schools to be actively working with them um, as, as a pilot. And one of them is going to be Jupiter Middle School. Um, and then global competence, we're having a teacher training for a, all of the teachers that, uh, what are the best practices for Haitian students? And that uh, training is going to be imp implemented this summer in August. And we want to partner with the, the Haitian Ministry of Education so that together we are helping teachers um, identify what are the best practices for, uh, for Haitian students. And finally, we are planning to do a global language competence for all administrators uh, so that they're able to um, be able to look at those criteria. What is it, what, what does it look like and, and implement it in their schools. Um, now, finally, we have done this year uh, strategic international partnerships with the countries that are represented here. Uh, we are hoping that we have an MOU uh, we have MOUs in progress with all of these countries, and we're hoping that in September we can bring them in, uh, the consuls of all of these uh, countries, and being able to sign that MOU uh, and have the board approve it. And um, each of these uh, programs offers a different uniqueness. Uh, Mexico has a very strong language materials in Spanish, uh, very rigorous that they will be providing those materials for us, including um, secondary education and post-secondary education that could be offered to our children in their native language. Um, France, I already described their, their program. Japan uh, has, is, this, is the largest investor in Florida, is Japan. So um, there is a lot of industry, and we want to link with them, particularly for the career academies. They're very interested in aeronautics, and, um, and they also have programs for students that graduate to go to, to teach uh, Japanese in, in Japan or to um, do further studies in a Japanese school, all of that for free. Um, China, um, we want to do teacher exchange and cultural exchange. Um, Haiti, I already talked about it, and Spain, we've had a long partnership with them, but this year for the first time, one of our students is going to a scholarship in Spain completely free, a full ride uh, for, to teach, uh, to, to register in the University of Valencia for four years completely free, so. And I now will just, if you have any questions or any Mrs. comments. Mrs. Brill and then Mrs. Whitefield. Thank you. And the first thing I want to say is thank you. This has been a long time coming. Um, it's a direction I think we should have embraced a long time ago. And so I, I can't resist to just say something before I ask my question. So, uh, many of you in this room will remember, you know, that, well, backing up, Odyssey Middle School closed its doors. And many of you may remember that years ago, I asked that we consider making Odyssey Middle School into a dual language school. And at the time, I was told it would be too expensive, even though Hagen Road had no school to feed into. Um, you know, but it was something that I put out there. And you know, I, I have to say, it would probably still be open and thriving had we gone in that direction. So I'm, I, but I'm thrilled that we are now moving that way. So I, I do have a question and one comment. Portuguese is said to be one of um, the, the world's five fastest growing languages spoken in Brazil, also in, in many parts of Africa. I, I would hope that that can be on our radar for the future because it is one of the fastest growing languages. And then my question is, when you're talking about Chinese, you mean Mandarin, correct? Mandarin, and, um, and we are going to just do simplified, because that's what the, the government of, uh, the Ministry of Education of China supports. Okay, thank you. And when it comes to, to Portuguese, yes, in, that, in, that, um, in the um, south region, we, uh, in West Boca, that is the language that is the next one in the line. <coughs> Mrs. Whitfield, and then Mrs. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to reiterate Mrs. Brill's statements of thank you so much. This is awesome. I can't believe we're here at this day where we get to see this. It's so great. Um, and then I have to complain because why did Mr. Barbieri get the Italian schools? <laughs> <laughs> so I may be uh, making some appearances at the Loggers Run classroom to learn more Italian practice and get better. So um, I um, wanted to bring up slide 13 because I had a question about it on, um, or sorry, 
sorry, page 13. Um, if you look at that, I know you mentioned the secondary students participating in world language courses, but it's my understanding that high school students are required to take a language, is that right? Yeah, so um, I was curious if these trends also held the same for elementary because my impression is that it would skew a little bit more to the English language learners in elementary school, is that correct? For, you think? I want to just correct, it's not required. We highly encourage, majority of our kids do do a world language, especially if they're going to a post-secondary institution where most institutions require that. Yeah, so if they want to go to college, then they probably should take one. So I would say most kids probably do take one. Right. Okay, so do you think that, am I right, that more English language learners would be in the um, programs that taught a language um, in elementary school than they're currently represented here? Because if you look, the ELL programs are very, they're, they're low among these people in this school. We would have to, to get back with you on the specific numbers. Um, in elementary, we do have more dual language programs. Okay. So we have more ELs in a dual language program in elementary. So, but to get specific numbers in terms of elementary, because we have some elementary programs that are world language as well, you know, through our IB program and things like that. So we can get back with you on some specific numbers. So I have a couple of thoughts around this that I'd love to say publicly. So I think that, um, you know, just from my experience sending a kid to a dual language program every day for the last five years, um, that there seems to be a, a perception difference between certain schools and different teachers and principals who see um, the opportunity for a dual language program not as prestigious as I would like it to be. Um, I mean, I don't care what people think about what she does, but there, um, I would love it if people saw the opportunity to learn a language and that our dual language program affords them as something that is um, great and wonderful and people should be banging down our doors to get into it. So um, I would love to see that and I don't like the idea that it's just a place we put the kids that don't speak English. Um, I, I think that um, it's a great opportunity for them as well, but I think that the balance should be there, that we should be able to advertise it as something wonderful and hopefully market it as such. Um, the other thing that I think is really important around that is that when a kid gets to like third grade and they're really not grasping the language, what do we do then? Because um, I think there are some kids that are just not getting over that hump at that age. And I've watched them in my daughter's school specifically withdraw from the program because they weren't quite getting to a place where they felt comfortable in the class anymore. And it does get more difficult as time goes on. So what do we do when that happens? Um, how do we as a system react to a student who's not grasping it? Or should we be approaching that earlier if you know, by first grade they're really not showing that desire to really learn it? Or what do we do then? I mean, there's a couple areas that we have to first look at. Um, one would be first around the fidelity of the programming. Um, and if we have strong fidelity in programming and students still experiencing challenges, I think Dr. Pinkles, you probably had most experience in previous roles where yeah, we counsel certain kids into. Right, the difficulty is that language has to be uh, very prominent in the lower grades. And the, the, the amount of, I always describe it as a, as a pyramid. The, the amount of language exposure in the lower grades has to increase because that's when language is concrete. So, so that's the opportunity to be able to be, build that language. If some of the schools fail to increase, to have those opportunities for language in the, in the lower grades, by the time they get to third grade, that's when just the content becomes very abstract. And then you really need to have a heavy load of language that some kids don't have. So the natural, situation is that the teachers actually back off from language even more and then they that's when the, the the fidelity problem begins because they begin to think that by moving into English you're going to do better and actually that works against the, the program so that's where we see that if the students are not successful this is one of the dreams that we want is to be able to have enough options so that if they are not successful in a full dual language program that has a tremendous uh, requirement and, and it's just a heavy load because you're teaching in the language and you have to depend that the students are building that proficiency, then we, what we envision is that we are able to increase other offerings so that the students who are able to take it as a world language, which they're not gonna have at the end the same outcome, like Harvey, when Harvey was talking about different options for different uh, circumstances, that's the way that we envision is that at the end, language is seen as an asset, 
and people are able to celebrate language in every shape or form. And in some of the Asian societies, some of the other states, what they do is that it's not just a requirement that people are fully bilingual in the business world, um, but sometimes it just, they require a survival language so that they may be able to open a meeting in another language and then move quickly to English because everybody else speaks English. But, um, but at least, so, so we, we want to be able to have shades of language proficiency that in the past we haven't had. Oh, I love that, that's really good. I wanted to say I love your quote about the monolingualism. I think that is a really true statement that just we really should be leaning towards that. And I wanted to say, you know, anything that we can do or that I can do um, from this position to support children getting a language, um, you know, I would like to do because I do think this is where we're headed as a, as a community specifically, but as a country and a world. Um, I would like to, um, I lost my thought. <laughs> I lost my thought on it. Um, well, anyway, I just want to say thank you so much. I think this is really um, this is really good, and it's a good thing for our community to be leaning towards this. And, and I'm I'm very excited about the work you've done. So thank you so much. Mrs. Andrews, thank you, and I'm pretty excited, uh, Mr. Oswald and team. Uh, you're doing it. Uh, when I look at Miami Dade and the other big counties, the programs having now our assistant superintendent for global affairs, we're catching up with some of the other districts who have put an emphasis here. So I'm pretty excited. One, a couple of questions, and I'll just do them both and you can answer. Uh, the feeder patterns are, uh, and the con uh, continuity of the language between levels, I worry a lot because I have a dual language program at uh, New Horizons Elementary School, and I would like to really be on record to say that I really want there to be a pathway in that area at the middle and high school level. The same thing that I'm looking at for Gove Elementary School, uh, and they're going on with the intermediates next year. So I really do want those children to have a place to go. And I see it when, as we look at all of the Palm Beach County School District, there should be a feeder pattern for the children that are participating from elementary, middle school to high. And I know that it is, uh, it's, it's a challenge, but we have to work on that and get principals and, and everybody ready. I worry a lot about the recruitment, and I know you've done a great job, uh, Dr. Pinkos, with the MOUs. I look back at 2003, we worked together with Spain and putting that MOU together. As I look at all these MOUs with the other countries and how we're taking it to the next levels, the recruitment piece is real critical in getting the teachers. And my question is for the visa, are you getting the support necessary once you do put together the MOU with the other countries, the visa piece with the school district of Palm Beach County and the other count, uh, countries, is that flowing smoothly and everybody working together to make sure that we're having success and recruiting the top talent to be able to you know, continue these programs? Uh, we're exploring several options. And there's, uh, there is uh, a, a broad variety of different options, and they go all the way from having our district be a, 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 a J-1 visa um, provider, and that would be a process that would take uh, a year, so we're looking at what would that take. Uh, the H-1 visas, uh, there is so much political turmoil around the H-1 visas that we feel that at this point we probably should not go into that direction, but there is, there is, we were doing a lot of work with J-1 visas. There, is, there are companies that are uh, in charge of providing those visas, and in some cases they're a little expensive, and we are looking at that too. And finally, one of the programs that we're working with very closely is a program from Confucius Institute, it's just that it's only, it's only China in which they find the visas and they actually provide money for the districts that are implementing the program. So, so we're not ready with an answer for that, but we are exploring to see what works best for our district. Thank you. And can I just also respond, the, if you look at number three in terms of your first question around like specific schools like New Horizon and Gove, that the Spanish for Spanish speakers pathway is, is really to help support those as we continue to build programs. Um, so the thing that's happening at Jupiter Middle School next year, we are hoping to move to the middle schools that feed to, from New Horizons and then also to Lake Shore. Like those are, that's the pathway that we are creating with our World Languages uh, team, so. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barbieri. I too want to thank you for this, um, especially you, Dr. Pinkos. I know you've been working hard on this and should have got this gone with you years ago and unfortunately 
the district didn't, but I'm glad you're finally there. I also want to thank Mrs. Rico because uh, although she's sitting up here quietly, she had a lot to do with the Italian connection. And Mrs. Uh, you, you, can, you have an invitation to come down to my school anytime you want to. But I'm, I'm thrilled that Sunrise Park is going to be the Italian school because Mrs. Steiger quickly called me and reminded me that she's Italian and just <laughs> her maiden name is Italian. So, um, but when I visited my family in Sederno this past September, I got to visit the elementary school in Sederno that wants to partner with us. And, and, and the kids there are looking forward to Skyping with the kids at Sunrise Park as soon as, so hopefully in the fall, I'm taking Italian lessons very, very quickly now so that I can say something to those kids because when I was there in September, I couldn't say a word to them except ciao. So um, <laughs> so now, now maybe I'll be able to talk to them when they talk to the kids at Sunrise Park. But I'm thrilled that the Italian, um, the Italian program is starting down in my district. Uh, Mr. Capitano wanted the middle school. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do with Mr. Summer. You know, maybe we can put an eye on the end of his name and call him Summer, Summeri or something. We can, uh, we can in induct him into the Italian language course. But... Um, but thank you all for the gr great uh, program that you're putting together. I appreciate it. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. I want to thank you as well. Um, so but I'm looking for room for expansion. <laughs> okay. So tell me, this question was asked of me yesterday. Why is it that all our dual language programs are Spanish to date? Well, we did have a dual language program in, in Haitian and French. Mm -hmm. And um, part of the problem was um, there wasn't enough planning and there was a, le a, a change of the population and the program began to suffer. One of the biggest problems, and that's why it's one of the challenges, um, is the materials. The, the plan a, a dual language program wo works well when there is an equity of power between the two languages. Students cannot see that, uh, that in one side, in, in, in the English side, there's all of these materials and all of these um, resources, and then they go to the other class, and there is hardly any material, so they're uh, teacher made. And so in, in Orchard View, which is where we had the program, it, and it was French, the, the community had asked for French and Creole, but to start with French, because at that time, the community felt that that's what they, the Haitian community felt that they wanted um, French. Even in French, we couldn't find the same type of <coughs> curriculum that we had in the English class. Uh, part of it is just the economics, that we, the, the publishers don't, don't, um, don't have the same level of, of support. Uh, and, and it was always a struggle. So uh, one of the ways that that's why we want to move into these different shades now um, is that with the La Belle France uh, Education, they don't require the full dual language. They, they are okay with one class of language and one area of content. And that area of content, all they require is that 20% of the time is taught in the language. So that's a, that's a lower load than, than a full dual language program. Um, basically, the main reason has been, and I don't know if you want anything to add, is basically the materials and, and, the, instru and, the, and the teachers. So that has been much easier to go with the Spanish. Um, we have, I've wanted to expand because I think every child can learn multiple languages. And, and I think we need to, and particularly when it comes to, to um, Haitian Creole, um, students that speak Haitian Creole, they don't, they speak French in some cases, but it's two <laughs> distinct languages, but they have a, a natural ability to be able to, to do well in French. So, um, so that's how we are trying. Denise uh, Sanon is very excited about this. She is forming, uh, when Ms. Rico and I went to Haiti recently, we went to a school, one of the top schools in Haiti, and uh, the school does most of the work in uh, project-based learning. Uh, the projects that the kids do are such a to, to a social level that the students are assessed in those projects, all of the content areas. And uh, the students, we, we asked what are the hours of school, and they said no, because they're doing their projects. They usually arrive like at 6.30 in the morning, and they don't leave until 6.30 at night because they're so excited about the work that they're doing. So we, we are doing a partnership with them, and Denise has already reached out to that principal. Um, so that they could do a partnership and the sister school in which some of those projects can be developed and, and use the language as the kids are beginning to learn it. So, so we're excited about that. And I would just follow up and say, because that is a challenge in terms of resources, every time we meet with any publisher or any 
online program, we're always asking how can we uh, get more resources so that one day we, whether they're in Portuguese or in Haitian Creole, or, that we could open other opportunities. So right now our goal is to provide as many language options for students, but then knowing that there are, there could be other opportunities once we are able to find the right resources to really sustain the program longer term. May I follow up? So I appreciate that. I, I really appreciate that balance of power as you describe it. But right now, it's just all English. So it's 100% versus zero, right? So if it's 20% versus 80, that's better, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to encourage us to get <coughs> moving because we have a significant Haitian Creole population, right? And while I always, I always view the dual language program as um, creating those global citizens, right? What really struck me in these recent conversations, and, it, and shame on me for not, the light not coming on before, is if it's a student who has recently come, whether they're Spanish speaking or Creole or whatever, if, that, if their content is being delivered in their primary language, they're going to learn that, right? While they're making the transition to be truly bilingual, right? And so we're not affording that opportunity to our students who arrive and speak in Haitian Creole. And I'm going to add, just for the sake of cause and promotion, is that is in fact what the issue was when the Oakland School District talked about Ebonics. Now, I am not gonna say that we should have a dual language Ebonics program, but I wanna be clear what the issue is here, right? And so I think that we are truly, we are actively doing our Haitian students a disservice by not moving forward with both French and Creole, right? Because of that, be, I, I get the balance. I think that that is really very interesting, but 100 versus zero is just is just not at all acceptable. Right? Dr. Robinson, if I can interrupt, mm -hmm. we do have some na native language support in content areas. So for example, my own experience, we would teach <laughs> Algebra One in Haitian Creole. We had a staff that spoke the language, so all of our newcomers in particular at the secondary level, we do do that. Um, I'm right, a number currently of we do, do that in several schools. Uh, Boynton Beach High School has some of those native language supports. Barton Elementary will be starting that. Um, Indian Pine? Lake Worth High. In Lake Worth High. Indian Pines and Lake Worth High. So we're really trying to target the populations. Um, we can always you know, improve upon that, but we, we do have some of those two programs, the home language support, while we're building the other program. So Okay, so that's nice, but it's not enough, right? So. And then, now, I've asked before about trying to figure out um, demographics of our teacher and administrative positions, and legal would say, like, no, we shouldn't ask that question. But can we do a survey of teachers and find out who our Creole-speaking teachers are so that maybe then we can, they can help us to develop this program, right? And then after that, I don't, and I, I realize there's a lot of different, as I understand, dialects, but I think that we're also um, ignoring our Guatemalan students. From that same perspective, like can we deliver more content in the primary, I, I, as I understand that's gonna be more difficult, right? But still, I just want it in the back of our head. And then the last thing is, in terms of these global languages, it used to be, and I don't know if it still is, and I couldn't pull it up fast enough, that Swahili was one of the languages taught in the International Baccalaureate Program, not in Palm Beach County, by the way, but in other areas. And so I just, I wanna throw that out there, because at this point, um, none of these programs are really um, supporting the wholeness of children that identify as African, right? Okay, thank you. Right. And, Mrs. And Whitfield? Sorry, I remembered my thought, okay. and I wanted to get back to it because I, I um, wanted to ask this question. So um, I think we have a few children who do the dual language program till they get to middle school and then they leave. And I love that you're heading into that world language as a possibility after that, or even into high school. I was just wondering if that is something that it's kind of compulsory for them to put them in those programs, or does the student or the parent have to to go to you and say, you know what, they should be in the Spanish speakers or whatever we're gonna end up doing in the native speakers class versus just a regular class once they've been in a dual language program. Does that make sense? So, I, I, what we're working on our system approach and we, some of the systems that we put in place with the masterboard analysis, 
So we're building that as a new layer. So looking at the assets a student brings to the table. So if a kid's already been in a dual language program, that we don't wait for a parent or somebody else to make sure we get the kid in the right class, that we make sure that it happens. So we're building that into uh, the master board analysis for, uh, approach that Dr. Reese started and with our regional instructional superintendents as they work with our principals. Great, thank you. But the other, the other part, uh, layer about that is that that's why one of the reasons that motivated us to do the career connection, because when the students move to a transition to either middle school or high school, there's so many options, and sometimes they have to make a decision. Do they continue with their, with their language, or do they go to one of these other careers? And that's why we want to, to integrate it so that the kids have more options and, uh, and remain with their languages. Mrs. Andrews? Thank you, and you know, I just remembered back in 2003 when we just stepped out to begin this process and how much we've done, we still have a long way to go. And when I look at the department, your department, uh, Assistant Superintendent of Global Affairs, and then I look at the multicultural department, we've got to uh, fund it. <laughs> we've got to put the monies together. If we're going to do the programs that we truly want to do to help all children to be successful, especially those coming to the United States of America needing the kind of uh, help in their native language as well as learning English and getting to the next level. We've got to put money into this department, this, this whole program that we're talking about. It's lovely that we've made some minor steps here. I'm looking at Miami-Dade and the program that they have. We've been fighting just to get these baby steps, but I, since we're having such a wonderful discussion, we need to make sure that we put it on the radar that we're gonna have to have it, some more staff, we're gonna have to have a little bit more money in recruiting, looking at our visas, how we get our teachers together, and the program thrust to get us to the next level. Because we do need to reach out and do more, but we've got to invest in it. But you all can respond to that if that's something you've been asking for the additional funding. Mr. Barbieri. Yeah, Dr. Robinson brought up a good point. I mean, do, do, we, do, do we know that maybe we have, instead of waiting for funding to bring a teacher from Italy or from France or Ch China, do we ask the, the staff that we, we might have teachers that are fluent in Italian here already that would want to move to the schools down in my district that have Italian or the Chinese that speak fluent Chinese that might want to move to Jupiter? <laughs> Jupiter. So, I mean, do we ask the teachers what if there's any fluent? Uh, they might want to move to District 7. That's what <laughs> Especially the, the, the Italian teachers that are there in Whitfield schools, I want to make sure that they have the opportunity. <laughs> right, we, we, yes. that's something that we can, we, we currently ask uh, self-reporting for teachers that speak other languages. Uh, sometimes uh, our, our culture has been so monolingual that people speak the, like for example, my daughter speaks Spanish, but I wouldn't want her to teach it to anybody. <laughs> so, um, so sometimes the language is not just that bilingualism, <coughs> it's just the biliteracy that is missing. And, and sometimes it's very hard to remain in the language when you don't have full proficiency because you go really quick to English. So, um, so that's, and we do have ways to assess the language of, of, of teachers, so. Um, and the good thing is that there's, there's districts in Texas currently that are now hiring their own kids because they have gone through those programs and now, and that would be the place that we, I would like to, to someday read about it in the newspaper. All right, thank you very much. I think we need to keep, move along. Um, I think that Dr. Pincus did make an appoint, uh, one important um, point there that we may not realize is that our teacher academy programs may need to look at at the uh, multilingual part of Teacher Academy and, and that opportunity. So our next topic is our uh, uh, capital budget